So I'm with Tar Sands Free Midwest. Um, we formed out of the Climate Crisis Conference back in February of 2013, and our goal is to end tar sands expansion in the Midwest. Um, kind of a lofty goal, but that's, that's what we'd like to accomplish eventually. Um, and as you'll see in this presentation, the Midwest is really the epicenter of tar sands expansion, or at least arguably the epicenter of tar sands expansion in, in the U.S., and we're really driving tar sands expansion in Canada. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that you know nothing, and I'm going to give you a really quick rundown of tar sands, starting where they're from in Canada, what they are, um, and then I'll talk about the Midwest, and, and then I'll go to, um, finally, my um, deepest concern about tar sands right now um, is the Flanagan South Pipeline um, and the permitting process that they're using to fast-track tar sands pipelines and, and all pipelines in the U.S., um, so that's where we're headed. Try to fit that all into 20 minutes, <laughs> or half hour, or 25 minutes. Okay, so starting at the beginning. So um, tar sands cover an area about the size of Florida. Um, they're in the um, northern, northwestern region of Canada, um, the state of Al or the province of Alberta. Um, so, so the actual tar sands cover the size of Florida. What they've actually mined of that is a, you know, it's at this point a percentage of that. Um, this is the boreal forest, which circles the globe in the northern hemisphere. Um, so I, I didn't, I couldn't find any great pictures of the boreal actually, unfortunately. So they're kind of low res, um, but you get a sense. So the the boreal forest is actually the the greatest carbon sink in the on the planet. We think of the tropical rainforests as as the most important in terms of absorbing carbon emissions, but it's actually the boreal forest that is the most important. Um, the boreal forest is 29% of the world's forest cover. Um, it's more, more car it, it absorbs more carbon than temperate and tropical forests combined. Um, only 12% is protected, unfortunately. 30% is already designated for logging and mining. Um, it's the largest area of wetlands um, any, in anywhere in the world that is in, within the boreal forest. Um, and it contains some of the world's most pristine glacial waters. This was from a National Geographic spread that they did on tar sands. Um, and you just, you get a sense of, um, it's an area with a lot of water, you know, the water, wetlands everywhere. Um, here's a before and after shot of the, um, the boreal forest and what they are turning this into, these moonscapes of tar sands mining um, in which they have to literally strip mine the earth, um, remove all, all wetlands, remove all trees, all life, um, and, and kill everything in its path. Um, what remains here, these, these waterways that you see that remain, um, those are tailings ponds. Those are waste wastewater sites that we'll talk about in a second. Um, here's a closer image. Um, and these span for miles and miles and miles. Um, this is what the refining process, the, here they're, they're upgrading the tar sands because when they mine tar sands, it's, tar sands are so thick, um, <coughs> uh, below 50 degrees, they're actually as hard as a hockey puck. So they're, they don't flow naturally on their own. Um, above 50 degrees, they're like molasses. Um, so what they have to do to be able to, to import them to the U.S. is, um, they have to upgrade them, what they call upgrade, and that's what's happening here um, on site in Alberta, you know, in the middle of the boreal forest. Um, that's what you see here. They pump it full of chemicals, this molasses-like structure full of chemicals, and hot, they use a lot of hot water to eject it, and, um, and that becomes a partially refined product um, that then they um, transport, usually via pipeline, to the U.S. and other, you know, around Canada. This is what a strip mine looks like. You can see how much they have to dig into the earth. Um, it's actually to create one, uh, like this is a figure that's really hard to grasp, but try to grasp it, to create one barrel of oil, which fills up about three quarters of a Chevy Avalanche truck. I guess it's an SUV. Does anybody know? I'm assuming it's an SUV. Um, three quarters of a tank of gas to produce, which is one barrel of oil. It takes four tons of earth that must be removed, and hence you see this, you know, immense mine. And the reason is that the tar sands is, um, 
you know, that what I described is that molasses structure. Well, even to get that, it's, it's actually, um, when they mine the earth, only 10% of it is that of the earth that they have to take. So they have to extract that out of the sandy clay water mixture. Um, so that's, this is strip mining. There are two ways to um, extract tar sands. The other is called in situ, where they have to inject huge quantities of hot water that I think is heated to like 250 degrees. Um, they inject that deep into the earth, much like fracking you know, causes fissures in the earth. And that forces this, this viscous substance called bitumen, that's the actual type name of it, um, to, to rise up. Um, that's actually more carbon intensive, even though it doesn't scar the earth in, in this way, it's actually more carbon intensive um, and, it, and it uses more water um, than mining. Um, this is what the what bitumen looks like. As you can see, it's not this is not a flowing product, and um, and and this is one of the reasons why um, when they say tar sands is a particularly um, dirty, so you know it's particularly dangerous and corrosive substance. It's because um, you know tar sand spill is not like a conventional oil spill, because number one, it's been pumped full of all these chemicals, and so you've got all these volatile compounds in the air after a rupture, after a spill, right? So you're breathing all of these toxic fumes. Um, and this is what happened in the Kalamazoo River spill. Um, people were getting lots of lung and lung problems. And um, as a result of breathing, for a couple of days, breathing those noxious fumes that went into the environment. Um, and, then, and then the product that's left, once those fumes go into the, the environment, what's left, this bitumen, is so heavy Unlike conventional oil that floats, it, this, this bitumen actually sinks. And they didn't know that. They, they weren't prepared when the Kalamazoo River spill happened. They weren't prepared for sinking oil. And so their regular methods of cleanup didn't work, right? Um, and that's why three years, more than three years later, they still haven't cleaned up the Kalamazoo River. About 40 miles were affected, and a big percentage of that is still um, still uh, like not you know open to use um, and I'll talk more about that in a couple of seconds so so those strip mines that you saw the way the way that they move that quantity of earth four tons to produce a barrel of, of water of, of oil um, is they take these three uh, what is it if I was gonna say um, well these trucks that can move 40 tons of earth they're they're the size of a 3,000 square foot house so imagine you take a 3,000 square foot house and you fill that with, with all life that's in your path, basically. Um, and that's what these trucks do. Uh, they're about two and a half stories tall, the biggest trucks on earth. Um, you can imagine the emissions just to run one of these trucks. So it's, like I said before, very, very water intensive. Um, for the mining, it takes four, let's see. This is a little confusing. I'll have to double check. I don't know if this is this. I don't know if this graph is correct because actually, in situ takes more water. I'm I'll, sorry. I have to double check in this graph. Um, the the side effect of of the first the preliminary upgrading process is they create these massive toxic tailings ponds, um, which are unrecoverable. Um, I believe. I um, I believe that ninety percent. I'll have to double check on that. Ninety percent is unrecovered. Um, but, but anyway, these, these toxic tailing ponds are so huge, so vast, that they, you could see them from outer space. And um, one time, 1,600 birds, it's a migratory bird route, by the way. And so one time when 1,600 birds landed on route, um, they, land, they died upon impact just immediately. So, so now what the companies do is they, they put these cannons off so that the birds hear the cannons and they don't land in the toxic, the tailing ponds. Um, let's see, but these, these ponds, I'm trying to, give me one second, I want to tell you, oh, um, in turn, so the ponds leak, and that's another major problem. Um, Environmental Defense Canada has documented that every day, this isn't like special circumstance, every day, um, there's one billion gallon, oh no, sorry, I said every day, um, there's one billion gallons per year, or 2.74 million gallons per day of poisonous wastewater from the tailings ponds that's, that's leaking out into the environment. Um, so these aren't, you can't really contain these ponds. They're out in the open. They're just, you know, part of the environment there. Um, the effect on fish, 
there, you know, in First Nations communities who live up there, there are um, cancer rates, rare cancers that are now occurring at extremely high rates. Um, the fish are coming out with these tumors, and you know, they're they're just the environment is really sick now as a result. Um, so the Kalamazoo River spill, to go back to that for a second, this river spill is a really important case study because it's our first major tar sands spill. Um, it was the largest inland spill um, in the U.S. Um, basically, the, um, the EPA estimate, estimates that they recovered almost 1.2 million gallons of tar sands oil from the, the Kalamazoo River. Um, now, you'll hear Enbridge say that it was about a million gallons that were spilled, but a million, more than a million were actually recovered. And at least 150,000, they're estimating about 150,000 remain in the river. Um, so we know it was much more than, than what Enbridge is stating. Um, 350 families had to be permanently relocated, um, and three years later, the spill has not been cleaned up. Um, so so this, this, the Kalamazoo River spill is really important for us because as we look towards this massive expansion of pipelines that they are un they're undergoing at this very moment, um, what we have to understand is that this is not conventional oil that it's highly corrosive, it corrodes pipelines, and when it spills, it's impossible to clean up in water, impossible. It sinks into the earth, and so right now they're trying to dredge the river, which itself causes environmental problems. This, is, this just shows you um, the rupture point. Um, I don't know offhand how far it was. Joyce, do you know how far it was from the, the rupture? I think the oil was like couple miles from Lake Michigan like it was very close it be, it, with with the spill because the the river was swollen at the time mm -hmm. that the spill happened it came very close to Lake Michigan it was people were watching mm -hmm. yeah watching closely um, this gives you a little more detail mm -hmm. um, so what happened after that spill Enbridge the company that owned the pipeline that spilled they made the case that oh it's time to repair the pipe um, so, uh, so they, they actually, you know, were able to speed through these permit, permits to not just, not just um, upgrade it, but I mean actually enlarge. So now it's, it can carry twice the amount of tar sands. Um, and that's what, if you heard of the My, My Cats trial, um, mm -hmm. activists who locked down, they, they did a um, major action in Michigan, a couple of major actions. Um, they're now going through court. Um, but that, that was over the 6B expansion. That's the pipeline in question. Um, another, another spill that you're probably aware of, um, that's the Mayflower, Arkansas spill. Um, that's also a tar sand spill. And right in, you know, in the middle of a um, neighborhood, approximately 12,000 barrels of um, oil and water. It's oil, they say oil mixed with water, um, which is tar sands. Um, it's actually mixed with lots of volatile compounds as well. Um, 12,000 barrels were recovered, 22 homes were evacuated. And, and of course, these people, you know, you can tell it's like a nice middle class, quiet neighborhood, family neighborhood. Um, these people had no idea there was a tar sands pipeline, let alone a pipeline uh, in their backyards. Um, I don't think we'll have time to go through this, but um, just really quickly. So, you know, greenhouse gas emissions with tar sands up 250% increase in carbon pollution. Um, let's see, so um, Al Gore quote, he says, for every barrel of tar sands oil they extract, they have to use enough natural gas to heat a family's home for four days. And they have to tear up four tons of landscape all for one barrel of oil. It's truly nuts, but you know, junkies find veins in their toes. And, and, and this is really a sign that we have reached <coughs> peak oil, that you know, easy oil is no longer. Um, and that's why we're doing this. And that's, we can afford to do this because the price of oil is high enough that it makes this profitable. Um, tar sands, to put in perspective, is not the worst oil out there. Unfortunately, there's actually worse. There's more devastating oil. Um, this is in terms of um, how difficult it is and how expensive it is to mine. You have onshore liquid oil um, and then shallow water liquid oil and then the third is heavy oil and oil sands, and then you have um, ultra deep water oil and then polar oil, so what you find in you know, Canada, Greenland, and Russia, 
Um, and then shale oil is, at this point, the worst um, where you, we, we find in Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. And they are, as far as I know, they are um, planning, they're in the works to um, mine for shale oil in some of our national parks in those three states. Um, bitumen is a junk energy, so it takes a lot of energy to produce. So compared to conventional oil, um, it produces one, one unit of, ener of energy. Tar sands produces four to six units of energy, whereas conventional oil produces 16 units of energy. So four to six versus 16 units of energy that you get out of the same quantity of energy put in to produce the product. You see. Um, okay, so now we move to the Great Lakes. What's going on in the Great Lakes? Um, an explosion <laughs> of pipelines. Um, they're also looking to ship tar sands by barge over Lake Superior. Um, that just got knocked down, thank God. Um, you know, the pro at least the first level of um, their application for a $25 million upgrade to this um, loading dock to be able to um, disperse, I think, the, the tar sands um, barges. Um, was the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources dismissed the application. Um, a number of environmental groups got together and you know, really educated the public and um, fought this off. So, so at, least, at least they've brushed it aside for the time being. We still really have to keep our eyes on this um, because shipping through um, Lake Superior you know, could be just uh, tar sands. Imagine, I mean, you saw what happened in the Kalamazoo River spill. Imagine if there was a breach um, in the in the lake, so drinking water to you know the Great Lakes, drinking water to forty million people. Um, so so that's one um, by land. Um, so this one pipeline that you see here is line sixty seven. It's the Alberta Clipper. Starts in Edmonton, Canada. Um, they just got the okay, or or they they are currently expanding the southern extension to Superior, Wisconsin. So that's in the works. Um, this, is, this is just kind of a basic um, map of the, the pipelines that we have, tar sands pipelines we have in the Midwest. Um, some of these are under construction. The dotted lines are proposed. Um, but actually, I don't know if you can see. Let's see. I'll show you this, this one right here. That's the Flanagan pipeline that I'll be talking about that goes from that's a hundred miles southwest of here that goes from Flanagan, Illinois to Cushing. Um, that shows a dotted line, but actually that's been approved and is under construction. Um, uh, some of these other pipelines are reversals, like this is a was a natural gas pipeline and that went this way. They're now um, I believe twinning it, developing a second pipeline to transport tar sands along the same route. Um, so they, depending on whether it's a brand new pipeline or a twinned pipeline, um, that all changes the whole permitting process. But you could see how um, we in Chicago, you could see how a lot, of, a lot of the pipelines kind of merge here, and then a lot of the pipelines merge here. But their ultimate destination, and they're building more and more going down to the Gulf. Um, and you can imagine, you know, they talk about energy security and that these pipelines are for we're, we're trying to expand tar sands imports because we want to get off of our reliance on the Middle East. That's the story they're telling us. But everything is feeding down to the Gulf. You can imagine that's not the most convenient place for U.S. energy, right? It's, it's going to the Gulf for export. So it's, it's very obvious when you look at the direction of these maps. And even, actually, if you read the oil company's own statements, they, they, they don't even deny that. I mean, that, that's, what, that's their argument to each other. It's like, we've got to get this oil out to greater markets and beyond. Um, another map, there's, there isn't one complete map of all the pipelines that are either under construction or proposed. There are just so many. Um, here you have the Gulf Coast Project is um, 830,000 um, barrels per day. Um, that's due to be completed or due to be started in 2013. Um, the Flanagan South is due to be started in 2014. They've already started it. Um, Seaway, uh, 850,000 to be started in 2014. So, I mean, there are just dozens and dozens of, of pipelines. So, how are we on time? 20. 20 minutes, okay. Okay, so um, now I want to talk about, I'm going to get into the Flanagan South Pipeline and 
um, that's that that pipeline that goes from Flanagan to Cushing. Um, and the and, and I'll talk about why this is so why this pipeline is really a test case. Um, it's the second such test case, and and I'll talk about why this is so crucial for us to be watching. Um, Obama, in his he created this uh, memorandum, in which he stated. Um, this presidential memorandum builds on a strong record of accomplishment over the past three years. Uh, he's been he's gloating about how um, he added 27,000 miles in the past couple years of um, oil and gas pipelines. Um, and then he says he wants to issue a specific memorandum in Cushing, where all those pipelines converge in Cushing, because they have all these refining and storage capacity. They have a lot of refining and storage capacity in Cushing. Um, so he, he issues a specific memorandum in Cushing directing federal agencies to expedite the Cushing pipeline, otherwise known as the Keystone XL Southern Leg. You know the whole debate about the Keystone. Well, he actually expedites the Keystone Southern portion, um, directing federal agencies to expedite the Cushing pipeline and other pipelines that relieve bottlenecks as the top priority of the new EO's permitting process. So how does he get them to expedite these pipelines while the environmental movement is really focused on Keystone? Um, they, what they do is he works with the Army Corps of Engineers to develop this workaround to expedite. And this is where Nationwide Permit 12 comes in. And your tendency might be to like gloss over and close your eyes when you start to hear this policy wonky stuff. But try to listen for a second, because this is really, really, really important to the expansion of pipelines in this country going forward. What they've done is, um, well, let me tell you first what NWP-12 is. NWPs are, they're basically, they're issued by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, they go back to the Clean Water Act, that it's part of the Clean Water Act. Um, and the point of an NWP is to fast track a small project that, quote, does not result in the loss of greater than a half acre of waters in the United States for each single incomplete project. Okay, so that's that's the definition. That's that's the the point of an NWP is to fast track projects that don't impact waterways. Um, and then another quote: activities that result in more than minimal individual and cumulative adverse effects in the aquatic environment cannot be authorized by NWPs. So if it's less than a half acre of water to issue an NWP, you can imagine that a pipeline, like Flanagan South is a 600 mile pipeline that couldn't qualify, right? Um, because actually Flanagan goes through 2,000 waterways. Um, and in Missouri alone, it goes through 568 streams and 239 wetlands. That will, the wetlands of which would have to all be com entirely and permanently be removed. So 239 wetlands already in this one project of course, it would not meet the criteria for an NWP, right? Um, instead, it would meet the criteria for a um, NEPA. Um, and I always forget what NEPA stands for, the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, yeah, so NEPA requires public comment. It requires um, an environmental impact study. And that's, that's a fairly prolonged procedure. That's a complicated, could take years you know, that's the, that's the way that they used to permit these major pipelines that are going through um, major waterways. But, but you remember Obama directed federal agencies to expedite the Cushing pipeline. And so prior to Flanagan, he, you, he got the Army Corps to expedite the Cushing pipeline, the southern leg of the Keystone, using an NWP. So how could he do that, this thousand mile pipeline? Going over, so again, now we're talking about the southern leg of the Keystone. That was the first case where they used the NWP to permit a thousand mile pipeline. What he did was he is, they issued, the Army Corps issued thousands of permits. They permitted the pipeline in, in sections smaller than a half acre. So if this is shocking you and striking you as like totally illegal, it should, <laughs> because it is. It's completely illegal. I'm not a lawyer, but it's like, you know, it doesn't take a lawyer to know that what they did is a complete. Um, you know, um, illegal use of this permitting process. Um, I want to take you aside for one second. Go. I want to um, just tell you about the state of our waters and streams in the U.S. 
just <coughs> because when we when we think about the state of our waters and streams, it seems even <coughs> more egregious that they're doing what they're doing with pipelines. Um, the EPA did their largest ever assessment of the waterways, the fresh waterways in this country, um, rivers and streams. And in two, this was from 2008 to 2009, so it's wor you know, I'm sure it's much worse now. Um, but 55% of their streams were deemed to be in poor condition, which means they do not support healthy populations of aquatic life. That's throughout the entire country. 55% of our rivers and streams do not support healthy populations of aquatic life. Tw only 21% are in good condition, and that's down 7% from 2004. So already our waters and streams are um, under a great, great threat. So this brings us to Flanagan South. They got away with it with the Cushing pipeline, the southern Keystone leg. Um, so they, you know, they're really excited. They're now applying the NWPs to Flanagan South, issuing thousands of permits to a pipeline that goes through. It starts in Flanagan, like I said, 100 miles southwest of Chicago. Um, goes through, through Illinois to Quincy. These are all farming communities. Um, through Missouri, Kansas, and to Oklahoma, to Cushing. Uh, Cushing, by the way, where that southern leg of the Keystone starts. So this is kind of, the, in a way, the replacement for the Keystone Northern Extension. So you could argue, and I would argue, that the Keystone is basically built, right? It's, it's a done deal. You know, the whole environmental movement's focus on Keystone is um, kind of a waste, unfortunately, at this point, because they've gone through the back doors to produce all these other pipelines. Key, and Flanagan is just an, one example. Um, just more pipelines, more pipelines. Oh, I guess it ends quickly. Um, so let me tell you a little more about Flanagan South. Um, so Flanagan South, can is, their plan is to be able to transport shale oil and tar sands through Flanagan South. Um, it's, um, let's see, so it received this expedited approval. Um, it crosses both, so not only, you know, I said 2,000 streams and rivers. Well, two of those are major, the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers it crosses, um, as well as hundreds of smaller tributary, tributaries. Um, let's see, um, and it's the site of numerous lawsuits, actually. So um, the Missouri Coalition for the Environment sued the Army Corps last year because they refused to even show these permits, these thousands of NWP permits that you couldn't even access them. So if you're a landowner, you know, not only do they not have to do public comments or anything, public you know, notification or anything, but they don't even have to show you the permits. In fact, in fact, they had to sue the Army Corps to even see those permits, and I'm not sure at this point whether they ever got them or not. Um, Sierra Club and National Wildlife Foundation sued um, they sued both with the Cushing, the southern leg of the Keystone, and they have sued with Flanagan South, um, alleging that this is illegal and that, um, you know, their their claim that each river crossing is a separate, a separate and complete project, is is wrong, right? Obviously, th that's that's um, not a complete project. The project is the whole pipeline. Um, so that lawsuit is continuing. The, recently, the judge knocked down their motion for an injunction to halt the pipeline while the, loss, the other lawsuit was going through. Um, in a 58-page memo, the judge basically stated, oh, the feds have no oversight over this. Makes no sense. Um, but it seems like the, the courts and the Army Corps and Obama, it seems like they're kind of, and, and Enbridge, the, the oil companies, pipeline companies are kind of teamed up here. Um, so um, Doug, Doug Hayes is a lawyer working for the Sierra Club, and he writes in one of the several articles on this topic, he writes, this is a six, on the Flanagan South, he writes, this is a 600-mile project that will clear everything in its path for a 100-foot right-of-way, and they're treating it as thousands of separate little projects. And so you can just imagine how, you know, how wrong this whole thing is. Now, why, why this is such an important case study is it's, like I said, the second of two right now. But I believe that they are setting a legal precedent to basically fast track all pipelines, right? Why else would they be doing this? Um, they will use this precedent. That's why the judge issued a 58-page memo for a simple motion for an injunction, um, because uh, they are setting this precedent. And so this could be used for 
oil shale could be used for frack gas pipelines could be used for any type you know so this shouldn't just be an issue involving tar sands activists but anybody who's concerned about um, you know maintaining some adherence to the Clean Water Act and other environmental regulations as well as having public input on pipelines that are going through their land um, um, then this this case I think is deserving of national a national focus to the extent that the Keystone XL struggle did um, but as of yet no environmental no large environmental organization has taken this up as a um, as a campaign aside from the lawsuit the Sierra Club has um, has been doing um, there's no major organization taking this on um, there are small organizations like for example in Missouri the Great Rivers Environmental Law Center um, issued a um, a comment that they wrote to the Army Corps disagreeing with the, the Mississippi River crossing but but here's the other challenge with this you would have to challenge their permitting you'd have to write one of these like 10 page um, memos, comments for every single crossing of the 2,000 crossings, right? You'd have to contend, you'd have to legally challenge every single crossing. Um, so it's impossible, right, for us to have any impact if we don't overhaul this entire use of NWPs for these massive projects. So I think I'll close it there. Oh, and I want to really quickly tell you. Um, Tar Sands Free Midwest is um, showing a film at the um, Landmark Century Theater on Thursday. So you're all welcome to come. It's a regular movie ticket price. Um, I actually have two tickets if anybody would like to purchase one today. Um, we're almost sold out, but that's Thursday. It's on carbon trading, the problems with carbon trading around the world. Um, I met the filmmaker at a um, Tar Sands conference in Canada. Um, and I hope you'll check us out on Facebook, um, Tar Sands Free Midwest. Take a look, join us, and we meet the second Sunday of every month. So um, those meetings are open, and we hope you all will, will take part if you're interested in the issue. So I'd like to open it for questions, if anybody has questions. Any questions, comments? Chris? Yeah, my question was, I know that um, pushing down to Eastern or whatnot is fairly planning it as a process, but when you say that they're trying to connect, is there any current tar sands from the north that connect all the way down to the south? Or is it just conventional from all the connects right now? When you say connects, what do you mean? I mean, you're talking about these pipelines that begin in the north and then will eventually all the way get down to Texas. Are yeah. there any that, are, that there is a complete pipeline? One single pipeline? Yeah. No. Okay, so it hasn't quite, it hasn't connected yet, but the construction has begun from the north. South well, they can they can now get they can now get from the north to the south with all yes they're all connected yes there are connecting pipelines there's not one single pipeline but there are connecting pipelines where they can get the oil from Alberta to the Gulf. Okay. Mm -hmm. and um, is it true that conventional oil the the more uh, that already connects correct all across the country? Yeah. Yeah. These are just thicker pipes that carry the cruder oil. Well, they're actually often just using regular pipes that were made for conventional oil. That they're, uh, they, they need to install like pumps. You know, it's, it takes more pressure to push the tar sands through, so they need to install pumping stations. And you know, there are things they have to do to kind of upgrade the pipelines. But the fundamental structure of the pipeline, typically, they're not even changing as they transfer it from a natural gas pipeline to a tar sands pipeline. In the case of Flanagan, that's a brand new pipeline. It's a twinned pipeline. So there's, there's going to be two pipelines along that same route. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How do you answer the objection of people who are for the pipeline uh, when they say that this will provide jobs? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, in the case of Flanagan, it provides 200 temporary jobs to permanent jobs. Um, now, a worker, I read it on, on a chat in response to an article, a worker wrote in and said, well, so what are you saying? You don't want us to have even our you know, temporary job? Um, I mean, I think, I think the environmental movement has failed in making this argument. You know, we have not developed a strong enough um, uh, vision of alternative energy and, you know, where, where the country really needs to go. But, but ultimately, that's where the jobs are, right? If, if we would just take these billions of dollars in these projects and put them to alternative energy, 
what, what this is doing is it's locking us into a fossil fuel future by putting these bill many, many billions of dollars into each of these projects. We're locked in, right? So why can't we just take those billions and put them towards you know, clean energy, which will produce more jobs, studies have shown. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the, a lot of people don't realize though that when they say jobs, they think they're permanent. They think these are jobs that are going to last. They're temporary. Mm -hmm. It's a good question because that's one of their main arguments. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah, you know, you talked about the 2000 permits. So it's that to me is like a workaround. It's, it's clearly avoiding the spirit of the law and the, the intent. They have the authority, and they, you know, you're talking about all these agencies that are clearly in conjunction with each other. So, given that nature, in which you can't even appeal to your to the federal government to do anything anyhow, uh, what's the kind of culture of civil disobedience, or what actions you talk about by cats? But are there others, or what are the ways in which people are? I'd be interested to know what activities or actions people are trying to do in order to prevent construction, bog it down, prevent it. Yeah, things are kind of in the works right now with Flanagan. Um, it was ramrodded through so quickly that it really didn't give activists any time to, to do anything. Um, so like in this one, the Great Rivers Environmental Law Center, their, their op opposition that they wrote to the Army, they said the environmental assessment report that, that comes from the Army Corps is dated November 21st, but Enbridge is stating that um, they need to have this pipeline the drilling must be done by late fall and winter and be completed before spring, pl spring flooding becomes a real risk. And so their argument here is that the core properties, that means the property in question, which is under co the Army Corps' um, hand, are likely already occupied and that the project may already have begun and is likely to be well underway before the Corps can even issue this permit. So in other words, they, it seems like, it appears, that they were already constructing before anybody even knew anything was happening. So that, that has you know, really had a kind of dampening effect, I think, on activism, because it's happened so under the covers. Um, but at this moment, I mean, the, the pipeline's almost fully built, um, and we're still figuring out how to, I mean, we're still kind of building connections in all four states and um, trying to you know, build support against the pipeline. Um, there will likely be some direct action eventually. You know, it's hard to know where where people will decide to take it. Um, but I think that needs to there, happen. There has been some. Like with the my cats, they they right. did they did lock themselves to equipment. But not in Flanagan. Not in Flanagan. But were you thinking of Flanagan or in general? Just in oh, in general. Yeah, yeah there was yeah. one in Oklahoma. But what's yeah. getting real bizarre is the charges that are being brought against people doing these actions. In one case with the MyCats, they tried to get them to reimburse Enbridge oh, yeah. for the amount of money that they lost on a day's work. And for and for re this would have been a plea bargain, but instead they're going to court and they might face three years in prison for refusing to pay. Then in, was it in Oklahoma where they dropped the banner? Yep. And because some of the glitter that they had on the banner fell to the ground, they charged them with a fake terrorism plot. They caught, not that the terror, that the, I would say that the charge was fake, but they were saying they were doing like a faux terrorism thing, which could get them many, many years in prison. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, the chart, they're, they're really clamping down on um, tar sands activists. So I think it's part of that whole Obama's, you know, um, measure to fast track and just make these happen. I think you know it's all part of this picture where they're working very hard to make this happen very fast. Um, the other thing, I mean, to in my to my view right now, the main issue is education because nobody knows how they're fast tracking that they're fast tracking. Um, NWP is not a household term. Um, you know, who thought you would have to know? this policy stuff to, you know, understand what's going on in your backyard, but you actually really do. Um, you know, this could happen, this could come to our backyard, right? I mean, it practically is in our backyard, but it could come much closer. They could use these processes to fast track a pipeline right here in the city. Um, so, so to my mind, the first step is actually education. And so what I would like to do is, um, along that line, you know, really needs to be a nationwide campaign of education. 
So what I'm proposing we do is develop a, a film, a very short film, like a three-minute film that could go out in social media. Um, and ideally, I think it would be um, animation because, because it's kind of complicated, wonky stuff. If we make it kind of fun and animated, it might draw people in um, and have that be kind of a national campaign and it's on its own to spread the word about the use of NWPs. Because if everybody knows this is the way they're fast-tracking pipelines, then you know maybe people will attend public hearings and meetings, and um, you know maybe they'll demand from their legislators that this not happen. Um, right now, it's just it's happening so under the covers that it can't even be contested. So, so I think education is really the first step, um, and I think a direct action campaign is going to have to spring from that. I mean, right now, for example, like in these very rural. The communities. These are very often um, very conservative farming communities, and they're often also very poor where these pipelines are going through. So, um, Enbridge comes by with a five thousand dollar check, you know, or three thousand dollar check, and says, you know, we're going to start digging next year if you take this check. And for a lot of these people, that's like the answer to their prayers this year, you know. So, um, so getting community support in these rural areas is is a challenge and is what we have to, um, as folks who are in the know about the way these things are happening, it's up to us to kind of um, spread that word, spread the knowledge, if we can, you know, in the way we can. Are there other, any other thoughts or questions? Mm -hmm. It seems like there's quite a bit of bogusness going on, both with the licenses and what's going to happen to the oil when it gets down to where it's going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty egregious. I mean, as I was reading through a lot of these materials, and I'm I'm still studying it. I mean, it's so complicated, and you know, it's, I'm I'm just at the surface of understanding how they're pulling this off. Um, but the more I read, the angrier angrier I get because it's like it's it's clearly so. Um, it's such an abuse of power, you know. It's such a clear abuse of their power. Um, you know, it's one thing. It's one thing to legally kind of do the environmental. You know, that's that's bad enough because they do the environmental impact studies and they take two years to study all the wetlands and everything, and then they decide, yeah, we could just get rid of it all anyway. You know, that's horrible, right? That happens with with prior to the use of NWPs, they were permitting pipelines that they shouldn't have permitted, right? But at least they were going through environmental studies. At least they were allowing the public to comment. At least there was a, a period of time that you could challenge these things. And now there isn't, you know? And so if, if, this, if the Sierra Club lawsuit fails, and I, I think that's the third way that we need to be in support, we need to really amplify attention on this lawsuit. Because if it fails, um, I believe that they've really solidified their use, because that, that's gonna be you know, the precedent in the court that they're gonna then use to ramrod every other pipeline from here on out. Why would they? Why would they not use NWP if that's their goal to ramrod a pipeline? If if they can establish this precedent, you know. Now, do I remember correctly? Was the train that blew up in that one town in Canada? Was it contained? Did it contain yeah. The yeah. There, there, bitumen. There, there have been I think three recent trains that have exploded. And my what I've heard from a scientist who spoke about it is that um, it's not that the train derailed and then it exploded. It's that the, the chemicals that they have to pump, natural gas and other chemicals that they have to pump to upgrade the bitumen, are so volatile that in a train where there's lots of friction and movement, they blow up. They're more likely to blow up. So I'm glad you brought that up because, yes, travel by train, transport by train, is actually far more dangerous um, than by pipeline. Um, there's, no, there's no safe way to transport bitumen. There just is no safe way. They'd like to believe there is, but, um, but there but isn't. But what the company, what Enbridge and others are, are the, the energy companies are threatening if the pipelines don't get through, they'll just transport them by trucks or train. If you remember that explosion in Canada, mm -hmm. 47 people died and an entire yeah. town was gone. Yeah. You know, that's the type of volatility. Yeah. And I should look, I should include that in the talk. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, we, it, it's hard for us to grasp, like when we don't know somebody personally in that area, it's hard for us to kind of include that in our mental image of this, this narrative. But 
yeah, a whole town leveled, like 47 people that over transportation of our oil. Um, yeah. Is Canada planning on building pipelines to also help export? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they've got a bunch of them, and they, they keep building them. They're, I don't know what the latest is. They're trying to build a pipeline to the West Coast, and they've, they've gotten a lot of First Nations um, opposition that has stopped many of these pipelines. So um, uh, I, I forget what the latest is on, on the, um, their pipeline that goes to the West Coast. But, but essentially, because they've gotten so much opposition getting to their coasts, you know, there are pipelines going all over the place in Canada, but, but there, are, there isn't one as of yet that will go to the coast for export. And so it's actually been easier for them to cut through to the Gulf Coast in the U.S than to get to their own coasts because of First Nations opposition, how, how powerful and strong they've been. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? Is the issue that we really have to, because of what's happening with resources, we are going to have to go to other means of energy because they wouldn't go after this dirty oil if there was clean oil to get. Yeah. So I, I wonder if we're on a road to well, there's, they can keep going to dirtier and dirtier forms of energy, and that's where the shale gas comes in. You have the oil shale. Actually, there's oil shale and shale gas, and the oil shale is the worst. Um, uh, yeah, there, there are even dirtier and dirtier forms of energy, unfortunately. And so if our investment is in putting billions of dollars into that, then, you know, um, then we won't we won't develop the infrastructure for the clean for clean energy, and that's where we're headed. And the, and energy policy shows um, an increase over the next two decades, three decades increase in use of all fossil fuels. Um, even though climate predictions show that, you know, if if we increase, we're in huge huge trouble. Yeah. I think a lot of us here are concerned about the wars, and the conservative narrative is, is these, you know, domestic or somewhat domestic attempts at acquiring oil is that we can break <coughs> down or whatever the wars overseas. And so, how do you see? I guess how yeah, how do you engage in a dialogue where the narrative is so clearly not? on our side, like how do we initiate, yes. yeah. Um, of course, they're not admitting they're going to war <laughs> over oil. I mean, they're saying they want energy security, right? Um, it's a good question. Do people have any ideas about that? Um, I mean, I think, alt you know, I, I almost want to, my, my response is I want to sidestep that whole argument. It's like we need to get off of fossil fuels. We, we have... You know, we're, we're the investment that we're putting into these dirty energy product uh, projects um, is wrong on so many levels and is problematic on so many levels. And so, um, the other thing is, I mean, our, we still import even with all our tar sands expansion. We're still importing from the Middle East. You know, it's not like we're stopping Middle East imports. Um, Canada is second to Saudi Arabia in terms of quantity of oil and taking the tar sands into account. But it's going to run out, too. You know, I mean, everything's going to run out. Um, and then we just go to the dirtier and dirtier, more and more difficult forms of oil to, to access. But um, it's like, I think Al Gore's quote speaks well to that. It's like, like a junkie, you know, searching for a vein in its toe. And that's, that's exactly what we're doing. So when is it that we're going to wake up and invest in renewable energy? You know. People's greatest argument is, I think, you know, the standard conservative argument is, well, that's not available to us today, and well, it's really expensive, and well, but it's like, if we put all this money into research and development of renewables, we would get there, you know, we would get to that place. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the argument is, yeah, we want to wean ourselves off of all fossil fuels, not just Middle Eastern fossil fuels, all fossil fuels, for so many reasons. And isn't tar sands not used for domestic use? No, it is it, currently. It is? Yeah, it okay. is currently. Mm -hmm. I thought it was exported and used for No, to. not yet. Um, I, I'm assuming, now here's one other argument on, in terms of the question of war. 
um, tar sands is a great oil for jets, for jet fuel. And so I don't think it's a I don't think it's a coincidence that the Army Corps has gotten so, you know, has like been flexing its muscle so much to fast track these pipelines. I think it actually benefits the Army. And I, I haven't seen any research along those lines, but it makes a lot of sense. It's a great jet fuel. So um, that's likely to be one of the reasons why they're fast tracking all of this. But um, yeah, I mean, our gas in Chicago, part, some of our gasoline that we put in our cars is tar sands oil. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention um, another way in which we are at the intersection of tar sands expansion in the US, we've got the largest tar sands refinery, um, 15 minutes from Chicago, the BP plant mm -hmm. in Whiting, Indiana. And that, that refinery is 50%, 5-0% of Whiting's budget. So you can imagine, like, you know, that here's a case study of how we are locking ourselves into this type of energy. It's not just that we're dependent upon the oil, it's that we're dependent upon, it, it, it's the economy, right? It, it's a whole economy based on that thing, that one thing. Yeah, how much of the boreal forest has been used um, in this project and <clears throat> how much is left? Um, well, the boreal, you have, you have to remember when I said the boreal was um, 20, what did I say about the boreal? It's 29% of the world's forest cover. But that's not just in Alberta, right? That's around the globe. Um, so I don't have a quick answer. I'd have to look that up for you. But so the question would be like, what percentage of, the, of Alberta, mm -hmm. of Alberta's sure. boreal forest? Um, and I ha I'd have to look that up. I'd, but we could look at a picture here. Mm -hmm. um, these are the actual oil, s they're also called oil sands, tar sands, oil sands. The industry calls them oil sands. Um, so these are the actual deposits. And of that, I, th I believe that 30% has been designated. Um, but they haven't yet developed all of that 30 They've developed a small percentage of that. But I I'd have to double check to know the exact quantity. Mm -hmm. It's, it's only been a small quantity that they've actually developed, and it's huge. You could, you know, like I said, you could see the tailings ponds from space. Um, I, I also just want to emphasize, I kind of briefly mentioned it, but, but we, what we're doing here, you know, these are, these water, these like wetlands are glacial streams. This is the purest water on the planet. And that is what we are destroying, you know. And, it, and, and again, it's the carbon sink of the planet. Um, so absorbing more carbon from the atmosphere, which is what we desperately need with climate change to prevent runaway climate change. So this area is just so, so crucial um, on so many levels. Anything else? Any, any thoughts about what we could do to fight Flanagan and fight this NWP process? Yeah. But I like your idea about having the cartel doing something. Mm. Do you have somebody? Uh, we're we're looking um, to make it at the level that we want it. It would take a real professional, probably a company that does these. You know, um, that does these kind of activist um, promo film. You know, marketing kind of PR films. Um, so it's very very expensive. We've identified a couple that we really like. A couple of companies. The activist rate of one of them was twelve thousand dollars. So, that's our major, yeah, that's our major impediment. So, fundraising, we, we will need help with fundraising. And so, if anybody out there is good at grant writing or fundraising or social media, we need you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank as you. As far as you all. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.